My name is Polus. I'm a local YouTuber here in Lithuania. You're David Katler, right? NATO Assistant Secretary General for Intelligence and Security. Wait. No, yeah, no, I am. Okay. If that's even your real name, David. <laughs> What are the biggest intelligence gathering uh, obstacles that NATO and its members face? So, look, I think the first thing I'd point out is that I don't collect intelligence, actually. You personally know? No. Oh. Maybe I am right now. <laughs> I don't know. Um, no, but I think, I think the thing is people this, should this understand whole is... This conversation is going to be 9D chess. <laughs> is that the nations contribute intelligence to NATO. Mm -hmm. We have some intelligence collection capability, but it tends to be more military. So think the uh, the big airplane with the radar on top, the mm -hmm. NATO AWACS is one. Um, NATO has a fleet of five big uh, UAVs mm -hmm. that have radar sensors on them. We use those two for collection. Uh, but all of the intel data that we receive, the great majority of it comes from the nations themselves. Okay. So I think the real obstacle is trying to keep in mind that that you're not in a nation at home where the intelligence and security services have collection capabilities and authorities. You're in an alliance framework where you don't have those authorities and capabilities at your own control. You are in charge of ensuring that 80 or so intelligence organizations cooperate, share intel, right, organize their efforts so the intelligence community is not known for voluntarily sharing <laughs> data, let's so to speak, right? How does NATO get members to share valuable intelligence amongst 30 uh, other countries, even though they're allies? Look, I think fundamentally it comes down to, first, trust between them. I think trust in the relationships they have with each other, but also trust that the security is sufficient so that if they choose to share, when they choose to share, their people, their information are protected at the level that is required. Uh, because if you believe that anything you share would then immediately be lost, it's hard to imagine that you're going to be willing to share and put your best people into the alliance. The importance of the requirement the result that will come from the sharing, and then constant feedback. How was it used? Was it used effectively? Did we get a decision? Was an action taken? That then feeds a cycle that builds on the trust that lies underneath. Okay, and building on that trust, this was actually a pretty popular question when I asked my followers, like, uh, what do they want to know from this conference? So, for instance, if a country joins NATO, right, so it sort of gets access you could say, theoretically, theoretically, right, that it gets access to intelligence from other members. Does it or does it they not? They do. And I think that's a really key thing um, related to my role and mm -hmm. the work that the people in my division do and that the nations themselves do. Again, these services do. Uh, when you are a member of the NATO alliance, you have full access to the information that the alliance holds. And you get it simultaneously with every other ally. So a large part of my job, first, is to make sure that you have that good, strong security to provide that trust basis. Mm -hmm. The second is to be sure that allies receive, now at 31, soon to be 32, 32. maybe more than that, mm -hmm. right? That they, get, yeah, that they get at the full membership of the alliance the best intelligence-derived insights and advice that they can at the same time. And then the third big strategic task is to be sure that we work to constantly improve that understanding over time. Okay. And so I imagine that for every separate country, right, the intelligence gathering or just in general in intelligence capabilities are, well, they differ. Do you have like sort of a blueprint on uh, for, other, for other countries or joining countries or the countries that are already in NATO? Um, for new members and, and the ones that are all already in NATO, do you, is there a sort of a blueprint to bring their intelligence up to standard, or is there, or or not really? Some nations have broader ranges of capabilities. Some have global mm -hmm. interests and capabilities. Some have a narrower set of focus and capability, maybe on their own nation, on their own region, uh, their immediate environment. Some will look at space issues and capabilities. Some are more invested in cyber, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, so. I wouldn't say there's a blueprint so much as part of the challenge, and yet one of the really cool things about the job is that you really get to know the people, the leadership, the personalities, the capabilities of all these services. And, and again, what you're trying to do is facilitate and orchestrate. Because if you've got a problem in front of you that you need to anticipate and understand, what you want to be able to do is draw upon the capabilities that the Alliance has access to within mm -hmm. those nations and services that are most relevant to the problem. So to try to, bring, try to bring the best that those services can provide so you're sort as of early as you can. Delegate the issue to the ones that have the most uh, expertise in that particular area, right? Right, and draw on them then in that context. 
I see. Okay, cool. So what did uh, NATO and its members intelligence ag agencies get right get right in the lead up to Russians and to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and what lessons have they learned from past let's say mistakes or failures maybe in this specific scenario? Yeah, look, I think we got a lot right. Um, and I, there's always room for improvement, but I think collectively we got a lot right. Um, you've seen in in our terms the impact of strategic warning is one thing, but I think I think if I put it in um, in normal language, what I would say is the idea that we see a crisis coming, the war in this case, early on, provide a warning notice and say, this potential is here. And I say that was a success because you, you've seen the statements, heard the statements that leaders made for months before the war came mm -hmm. about the potential for that uh, to try to provide some warnings of their own politically, some deterrence in effect to get the war not to happen. Um, now, Putin's choice to engage in this war. Um, but nonetheless, you see the messaging uh, and the emphasis on this. That also enabled the alliance to prepare, to have really credible deterrence and defense capabilities brought to bear. You've seen a lot of movement of troop presence, um, air defense movement, aircraft movement, and all that to protect NATO territory, and also increase dialogue and support provided to Ukraine even before the war. So there's a lot of work that goes on in that space. Certainly not all of it is intelligence and security, but intelligence and security, I can tell you, made a huge contribution uh, in that from many nations and from the alliance as a whole. Uh, I, I think it'd be difficult for people to understand how, how, how long or how short the war would go. I mean, I usually get a lot of questions about, did you overestimate the Russians and underestimate the yeah. Ukrainians? Uh, look, I think everybody did, didn't they, in that? Now, it's a question of degrees. I don't <laughs> think anybody said the Russians were 12 feet tall, uh, but on paper, the Russians should have been uh, mm -hmm. quite capable and forceful, uh, but they failed miserably in just about every aspect of the war so far. And I think the planning, the preparation, the execution, all pieces of that. Uh, but one other point I just make, because I know, again, time's short, mm -hmm. is that you also see the power of pre-bunking, essentially, claims. So the strategic decisions that the U.S., the U.K. made, some other nations have made to release intelligence information in public mm -hmm. and explain what it means. So in the pre-bunking, what I mean is to say Russia could engage in a false flag operation in Ukraine's east mm -hmm. to blame Ukraine falsely for, yeah, to have for a the beginning invade, of the war, yeah. right. And also um, the U.S. Going to, going to such great lengths to actually say, this is what we understand their war plan to be. The war is illegal. It would be illegal if it were to begin. This is what we're concerned about specifically. That's a huge strategic development and a really brave choice uh, for policymakers to, to take in Washington. And I think that's another lesson learned from this war, that you see an increased power of intelligence in public communication in a way that you probably haven't in an incredibly long time. Yeah, in an incredibly long time. Uh, now, it's, uh, it, it's hard to answer specifically, but what is sort of the discrepancy between what we see as just, you know, a regular Joe like me, what we see on social media and what you guys actually know? Because I'm always like, there's always some news or some or gossip or anything in regards to war in Ukraine, right, uh, on social yeah. media. I'm looking at the I'm looking at the sort of reports, early reports, and I'm also and I'm always thinking, Damn, there's a dude in intelligence right now sitting, or dudes, uh, or, you know, just people in intelligence sitting, and they know specifically what's going on, but we're getting these reports. So how much, how big is the discrepancy actually? Like, um, do you sort of estimate, could, could you estimate it, uh, like, roughly? Yeah, look, I've been in... Does in, the question make sense, Like, Yeah, it does. And, and look, uh, I've been in... I've been involved in national security work since I was 17 years old. Um, I started at the Naval Academy and then got commissioned in the U.S. Navy okay. and then right, became a civilian after 9-11. Uh, so fairly long time. The job's really cool. Okay, you do see things that a lot of people oh, never I heard get you to see. There and, you, and you said that yep. you really love your job, yeah. I do. I love my job. Um, <laughs> that's why I've done it for so long. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I hope you can see it. You can feel it. No, I love what I do, and I really appreciate the work that the people that I work with do. Um, if you like to solve problems, to know the unknowable, if you like to build puzzles without the box. Should I enroll? You should enroll. <laughs> this is the business for you. Uh, it, it really, I mean... It's incredible I'm work. I'm probably just too old for that. I'm but sorry. I'd also tell you, no, you still, you're not that old. But I'd also tell you, 
that there's this really interesting compression of the space now, because think about publicly available satellite imagery. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot of great analysis that goes on in think tanks, uh, private people doing mm -hmm. analysis of that. Take a look on Twitter and Telegram at all of the analysis of combat losses in this uh, war between Russia and, and Ukraine. It's just amazing to see. And you, you do get a lot of really insightful comments that are out in the public space. Uh, and that's why it's so important then for us to continue to focus on, well, how do we modernize? What's the value added then of intelligence in this space? How do we stay ahead you know, to preserve that edge. Uh, and we do have it. We have a substantial edge, but it takes a lot of work. <laughs> okay, it's good to know. I feel, yeah. I feel, I feel your, a lot safer Your money now. is well spent. I feel a lot safer yeah, now. You should feel safer. Okay, so you said you love your job. You've mentioned that a couple of times now. So exotic locations, high-tech gadgets, invisible cars. You know of those, David, right? Attractive men and women, depending on your preference. Lots of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Nowadays, this seems to be the public perception of spies and, you know, espionage, intelligence and all that. So Bourne, Mission Impossible, James Bond, Kingsman, and so on. Do you have your favorite spy movie? I'm going to have to have you or? debrief when we leave here, though, because you mentioned The Invisible Car. Oh, so I'm sorry. Yep. Will sorry. You, um, will this message explode in 10 minutes or in 10 seconds or something? Do you have your fav a favorite uh, spy movie or series? There are or? a lot. I kind of like the, the newly rebooted James Bond series. Oh, I okay. It's really good. Skyfall was one of my favorites. Oh, okay. So, so does the 007 image of spies help or hinder your work? And uh, is the ordinary day of a spy anything close to what we see on the big screen? Look, I think it does both. Um, <laughs> because I think it helps certainly in recruiting. It helps you bring in fresh people I mean, uh, I'm with basic, different perspectives. I'm basically just enrolled, yeah. Yep, I think, well, let's we'll sign you up. But I think okay. that's really, that is helpful. <laughs> but I should say, just to make sure the record's very clear, my absolutely favorite uh, spy movie is The Hunt for Red October. Oh, okay. Because I began my intelligence career okay. in naval intelligence. Uh, and notwithstanding, Jack Ryan was a CIA employee, not a naval intelligence employee. We'll just put that to the side and say that movie is superb. Five out of five. How valuable are the Baltic countries in terms of intelligence, given that they historically have deep knowledge and good understanding of the current and constant adversary that is Russia? There is this sort of saying that, you know, let's assume that the average Lithuanian you know, knows the average Russian better than, let's say, the average Portuguese person or the average Spanish person, person sure. just because of geographical location and the, uh, let's say, cultural overlap. Yeah. So... Well, again, how valuable are the Baltic countries in terms of intelligence just to get to know the adversary better? Or are we just... Well, Look, I've got to start by saying every ally is invaluable. Um, but that said, I think certainly I have come to learn, appreciate, and really admire the perspective of the Baltic states, and especially the Baltic intelligence and security services. Uh, many friends, great colleagues in those services. And they've got a depth of knowledge and capability mm -hmm. driven by not just the proximity, but as you said, the history. Yeah. I, I'm still struck by how many of my friends and colleagues uh, are still serving and are old enough to have already been a, a professional in the business during the Cold War, during the Soviet occupation, and really appreciate the way of thinking, the culture, the approach. Um, it can cut both ways, though, right? Because you can also hear complaints that maybe you're too close to the problem. Uh, I tend not to see like that. Like geographically speaking? No, what I mean is emotionally. Mm, okay. You know, do you have a bias then? Mm -hmm. Because you've had this uh, yeah, yeah, experience, yeah, yeah. you've had this national experience. And what I tend to say is it's important to have in mind that those biases can exist. But we have a lot of training uh, and a, a very heavy focus in our work to be sure that we're able to separate our personal and organizational or national biases from these issues. Uh, there's a lot that the East and especially the Baltics understood of Russia that I think many of us, and I'd certainly speak for myself here and say that we underappreciated and misunderstood that I think this war has really brought home. Uh, so I think that's also a lesson that I've learned here. Have a very open mind, understand everybody's uh, histories, their perspectives, and really pay attention and listen because those contributions are going to be uh, incredibly valuable as they are from this region all the time. After Russia invaded Ukraine, how often did you get the good old we told you so from Lithuanian colleagues? Uh, a fair <laughs> amount. A fair amount, right? A fair amount. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't say anybody ran around and did a victory lap because they're all professionals. Yeah, 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 of course. Um, I mean, there's nothing to celebrate. It's just that... Right, and that's the of... thing, too, because it's, uh, yeah, it's not exactly something to celebrate. But the reality is, um, you know, then they come at it and say, okay, well, let's reset the discussion. 
especially as we look at lessons, identifying lessons and really learning lessons and then shaping the way of work in the future, let's consider this. I mean, you'd have the same perspective if you went to a Balkan nation and asked, well, what's the situation mm -hmm. in Bosnia, Herzegovina, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, in Kosovo? Uh, many nations have a perspective and have really good understanding and contribute to that debate. But I am, I am very likely to go to the Balkan allies first and ask, what's your understanding and perspective? And then also involve others in the discussion. Even knowing all their biases, biases yeah, right? Yeah, sure. Sure. Of course. Okay, cool. That is all I have for, for you today, David. Easy. Thank you very much cool. for answering yeah. my questions. Thanks thank a lot. Thank you for having this interview. Yeah. And thank you for Great coming to, do it to, with you. to Lithuania, Vilnius. Yeah, glad to be back.